Hi! Today we are covering the person known as the most courageous figure in the entire civil rights movement. So, let's just jump right on into it. Born outside of Troy, Alabama on February 21st, 1940, this figure was born in an era of racial segregation. This figure was born into humble beginnings. Their parents farmers and grew up working hard to help around the farm. This figure was a third of ten children and left school in the harvest months to help pick the farmer's produce. Their house had no electricity or water, and they used the pages of an old Sears magazine in their outhouse. This figure's childhood dream was to be a pastor, and they found their beginnings as a leader by preaching to the chickens on the farm. They claimed their intent as a child was saving their little souls, and would imagine them as their congregation. This figure grew up listening to Martin Luther King's sermons, and when they heard the news of the Montgomery bus boycotts, they were inspired to act for change. Growing up, they intended segregated schools, and were upset when the 1954 Supreme Court case of Brown versus the Board of Education didn't affect their schooling. This ruling made it against the law to segregate in schools, and naturally, all laws banning segregation wouldn't be upheld in the South without a fight. After they had graduated high school, they claimed they wanted to fight to desegregate Troy State College, but they were convinced otherwise by their parents. This figure's parents had tried teaching this future leader to accept the status quo and to keep their head low. Much to their parents' dismay, this figure wasn't going to listen, even if it killed them. They said, When I was growing up, my mother and my father and my family members said, Don't get in trouble. Don't get in the way. Well, I got in trouble. I got in the way. It was necessary trouble. This idea of necessary trouble was something that they held close to their heart, and they were their words to live by. In 1957, this figure left Alabama to attend the American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville, Tennessee. This is where they would learn about nonviolent protests. Almost immediately, they began organizing sit-ins at segregated lunch counters. This would mark the beginning of not only their civil disobedience, but their track record of being arrested. Despite their mother's pleas, they went on to participate in the Freedom Rides of 1961. There were seven whites and six blacks who were set on riding from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. At this time, several southern states continued to enforce laws prohibiting blacks and white riders from sitting next to each other on public transportation. Freedom Rides, which were originally organized by the Fellowship of Reconciliation, were brought back by James Farmer in the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE. These rides started to pressure the federal government to uphold the ruling in the 1960 Supreme Court case of Boynton v. Virginia. This case had declared segregation on public transportation illegal. These rides also helped to expose how passive the government was when blacks were met with violence for simply following the law. The federal government had decided to entrust black people's safety and lives with the notoriously racist Alabama police. Even when pressured to take action, all they did was have the FBI take notes of these assaults. In the South, this figure and other nonviolent freedom writers were beaten by mobs of whites, arrested on several occasions, and taken to jail. At the age of just 21, this figure was the first freedom writer to be assaulted in Rock Hill, South Carolina. He had attempted to enter a whites-only waiting room, and two white men assaulted him, injuring his face and kicking him in the ribs. Not only were civilians attempting to uphold the law themselves, they got away with attacking blacks for doing it. Not to be stopped, he joined a freedom ride that was bound for Jackson, Mississippi, just two weeks later. He was later imprisoned in Mississippi for participating in these rides. In Birmingham, the most racially divided city at the time, he and 12 other riders were beaten with baseball bats, chains, lead pipes, and stones. After fleeing and reorganizing in Montgomery, he was hit in the head with a wooden crate. He said it was so violent, he thought he was going to die. He was left bloodied and unconscious at the Greyhound bus station in Montgomery. Corps 
had to give up these freedom rights because of this violence. In a twist of fate, in 2009, 48 years after he was left at this bus station, he received a nationally televised apology from a former Klansman. In 1963, this figure became the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. During that same year, this figure was one of the big six who helped organize the March on Washington that Martin Luther King had his most famous speech at. At the age of 23, this figure was the youngest speaker at the event, and at his time of death, he was the only one who remained. His speech was censored to appease the Kennedy administration, but still a powerful declaration nonetheless. After the March on Washington, the Civil Rights Act became law, but this did not make it any easier for the black population to vote. To bring attention to these struggles, this figure in Hosea Williams led a march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama on March 7, 1965. Now this is something that stuck out to me. The county sheriff issued an order for all white males in the Dallas County over the age of 21 to appear in the courthouse to be deputized. As you could imagine, giving the most racist community the power of police instantly was a horrible idea. These new deputies and current officers met the protesters at the bridge into the city. Reverend Hosea Williams attempted to speak to the commanding officer, but the officer stated that there was nothing to talk about. Seconds later, the 600 marchers were attacked. They were beaten with nightsticks while other police officers were firing tear gas, and more were mounting horses to charge at the crowd. Now, this figure might not have been as blessed as Dr. King was at public speaking, but where he lacked in oratory skills, he made up for in bravery. This is not to say that other people in the civil rights movement weren't brave. This is to say that when the police came out with their clubs and their barbed wire, this figure did not try to find a way around it. They would march right into this danger, through the tear grass, through the harassment, right to the heart of the police swarm. His presence demanded their attention, and he wouldn't leave without it. He was severely beaten more than once, except this time he suffered a fractured skull. He managed to flee to a local church after this incident, and he had scars from this assault for the rest of his life. Young teenagers, even women, were brutally beaten. In the end, 17 people were hospitalized, and 50 were treated with lesser injuries. These violent attacks were documented by the press, and the police brutality was exposed to the world. This day would become known as Bloody Sunday to the black community. Not to be left without change, the organizers planned another protest for the following Tuesday, March 9th. Now, this next section might not strictly include our figure, but I feel like it's very important that we talk about. The night of these protests, three white ministers who were attending the march were beaten by the KKK. The worst off was James Reeb. He was taken to a hospital two hours away over fears that he wouldn't be treated there. He died on Thursday, March 11th, 1965. This was only 55 years ago. After these marches, in 1970, this figure became the director of the Voter Education Project, or VEP, and he remained in this position until 1977. VEP had faced many difficulties during the 1973 to 1975 recession, but by the time he left, it had nearly added 4 million minority voters to the rolls. In January of 1977, he ran for a government position for the first time in Atlanta City. He lost 68% to 38%. This figure was elected as a U.S. representative in 1986. This was following an upset, which this figure won 52 to 48%. This led to a strain in the black community of Atlanta, since many of the black leaders wanted his opposition to win. In the November general election, he managed to win Georgia's 5th congressional district against Republican Portia Scott. This figure was re-elected 16 times, and only dropped below 70% of the votes once. He was the only civil rights leader to extend his fight 
and to the seats of Congress. This figure would travel to Selma to commemorate its anniversary every year. At the 1998 ceremony, Joseph T. Smitherman, who was the town's segregationist mayor in 1965, gave him a key to the city. He stated, Back then, I called him an outside rabble-rouser. Today, I call him one of the most courageous people I've ever met. During his time in Congress, his presence alone now demanded respect. He was labeled the conscious of Congress. Every moment of his tenure was fighting for people's rights, and he never stuck to party lines, just his ideals. When Obama was inaugurated, he hugged this figure, stating that he was the only reason he was there. In 2011, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama. Obama stated, In generations from now, when parents teach their children what is meant by courage, the story of this man will come to mind. An American who knew change would not wait for some other person or some other time, whose life is a lesson in the fierce urgency of now. On July 17, 2020, John Lewis died of stage 4 pancreatic cancer exactly one week ago from today. His last appearance was in early June, in a virtual meeting with former President Barack Obama, addressing activists leading this summer's protests. John Lewis was a man who knew that people's lives or rights couldn't wait for the time to be right. He was a man who knew that being courageous was something that we all need. And sometimes, causing trouble is necessary to see the changes that we need. Hopefully we all could be a little bit more courageous in our lives to make change for the better. This is where I'm going to end off this video. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. This video has been in memory of John Lewis and all of his achievements. I hope to see you guys next week, and have a great day.